So as was already mentioned today, I would like to talk about the origins of attitudes towards immigration, which is based on an article I uh, prepared together with my colleague, Dr. Anne-Marie Janet from La Statale Milano. And uh, our research started with uh, the question uh, or observation that we have seen, which is that attitudes to migration epitomize the intergenerational political conflict, having both material and symbolic aspects. Think, for example, about the debates regarding Brexit when it was uh, claimed very often that it was actually the older generations that were more in favor uh, for instance, to Brexit due to uh, their anti-immigration attitudes. Um, on, uh, so we, we do find in many countries actually that uh, the old are generally more anti-immigration than the young. Uh, but when we think about it, uh, it is actually the older people that are more likely to benefit for immigration because they have a more secure labor market status. The pensions and health uh, care systems are more fiscally sustainable thanks to immigration. And immigration also brings lower prices of elderly services such as housekeeping and giving. So uh, from this point of view, it actually should be the older generations that should be more favorable um, to immigration. And uh, this, uh, this is how our research started with this puzzle. How is it possible that uh, the older generations, uh, despite rationally uh, being um, immigration being much more favorable to them, still uh, appear in many countries being more anti-immigration. And uh, many theories have been put forward regarding what is it about age, actually, that makes older people generally more anti-immigration. One of the theories is that uh, when we look at age, we can look at it as a biological factor, as a physiologic process that changes uh, with age. And, and the argument here would be that the cognitive capacity of uh, older people becomes uh, lower and therefore they, uh, their judgments and the, their evaluation of a social reality changes. Uh, then we also can uh, look at age as a life cycle transition. Uh, basically, uh, this means that as we grow older, we occupy different positions in the social structure, change roles and relationship and status. And uh, therefore, from in, in this point of view, uh, people's attitudes change as their interests and perceived benefits uh, change over the life course. So for instance, uh, this is also regarding tax policies. So when you're in the labor market, you might have a different uh, tax policy preference that you might have when you are in pension or you're just a student. And finally, we can look at age also as a cohort membership. Uh, what this means is that people born at a particular time and space encounter the same set of historical, cultural, and political circumstances. And these shared experiences during formative years, uh, in, in other words, youth, shape values and attitudes, which might persist over the life course of cohort members. So recent evidence regarding uh, the formation of attitudes to migration uh, confirms cohort effects. So when we isolate the effect of birth cohorts, a person biological age is no longer significant. Um, so what this means is that older individuals are more averse towards immigrants because their cohort membership, uh, not because as they are aging, uh, they become more critical to immigration policies over their life cycle. On the other hand, the scholarly understanding of uh, this cohort membership is still in, in its infancy. So we very often tend to include person's age in the models only as a routine demographic control variable. Uh, there is also a limited attention to age cohort as a social contextual influence. And uh, very little is uh, so far understood about the operating mechanisms behind systematic age cohort differences. So in our article, we uh, theoretically uh, base our research on, on two arguments. The first one is the so-called impressionable years arguments. And uh, this, uh, um, this is a soci sociological theory that claims that political orientations are formed in youth. So uh, in, in other words, as uh, when individuals are young, uh, their values are stamped uh, into them uh, during their youth. 
uh, because they forego a process of political socialization and adapt to their wider social and political context. So there is a certain period of so-called plasticity uh, during their transition from adolescence to adulthood. Uh, although there is no universal agreement on the precise age for impressionable years, uh, we as sociologists believe that this significant political socialization occurs between ages 18 and 25. Um, plus or minus, of course. Then uh, there are different socializing agents regarding attitudes to migration. It could be family, friends, peers, but also um, the school, the community, the neighborhood people live in, and also country characteristics or critical historical moments, such as, for instance, the so-called migration crisis in the 2015 or uh, uh, for instance, um, other Brexit or uh, the election of uh, President Trump in the United States and so on and so forth. And the other theory we based our research on is the so-called age persistent argument. And uh, what this means is that we observe that political orientations are remarkably persistent. So uh, sociological research shows again and again that uh, political predispositions acquired in youth are uh, usually remarkably stable over the lifetime. So people do not change their attitudes after a certain age very easily. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is also dependent a little bit what kind of attitudes these are, because we can divide attitudes into symbolic versus material attitudes. Uh, symbolic attitudes uh, have a much more effective basis and are much more likely to be stable over a lifetime. These are attitudes regarding, for instance, abortion, gun control, also immigration. Whereas material attitudes have a more cognitive and information basis, and uh, therefore they are more susceptible to changes during life cycle. Uh, for instance, uh, this would be, as I already mentioned, uh, tax policy preferences. So our contribution uh, was um, answering the questions, what are the shared political circumstances during cohort early years that mark their attitudes towards immigration later in life? And um, there have been already research done regarding this. Uh, so for instance, uh, showing that uh, landmark immigration events, such as, as I already mentioned, the so-called migration crisis in 2015, might affect cohorts attitudes to immigration. Also uh, cohorts that entered the labor market when unemployment rates were very high, hold more negative attitudes towards immigration. And the combined effect of cohort and education uh, diminishes uh, the effect of uh, cohort socialized in the context of a strong far right anti immigration presence, for instance. Our argument is that uh, even age cohorts who came, uh, came of age in the absence of landmark events still have distinct patterns, and we observe these. So uh, therefore, um, we, we argue that even the general national political climate uh, can function as a socializing agent. Uh, basically, our main argument states that political values that dominate the political zeitgeist during a person's formative years then impinge on their attitudes towards immigration as adults. Uh, what we mean by political climate is an ensemble of dominant norms and values that prevail in the political zeitgeist reflected in the views of the political elite. And um, we concentrate on two different values, uh, equality and tradition. So equality is the concept of social justice uh, and the need for fair treatment of all people, also those who are different from oneself, uh, protecting the more vulnerable and weak. Uh, therefore, we expect people uh, that belong to a cohort that experience a formative political climate where the principle of equality was predominant to have significantly more uh, likely to express support for immigration than individuals belonging to other cohorts. On the other hand, uh, there is also the value of tradition. So this is the motivation to maintain beliefs, customs and practices of one's culture and family and to avoid the violation of conventional expectations and norms. And uh, we believe that individuals who belong to a cohort that experience a formative political climate where the principle of tradition was predominant uh, are much more likely to express uh, negative sentiment towards immigration than uh, individuals belonging to other cohorts. 
So now we come to the methodology. How do we assess our hypothesis? Uh, we actually integrated uh, two different types of data. Uh, one was contemporary attitudinal data and the other one was historical political data. The contemporary data come from European social surveys uh, that were conducted between the years 2002 and 2016 biannually. So we have attitudinal data for eight periods and uh, we have 12 five-year birth cohorts which were born between 1931 till 1990. And uh, we have actually selected uh, Western European countries. Uh, the selection was based on the fact that whether data was available for all of these uh, periods, and also uh, whether these countries have been democratic since at least 1945, uh, because in case the countries have not been democratic, we cannot observe changes in the elite or the political party at, and power. So we do not observe also the changes in uh, the actual values in the political zeitgeist. And uh, so we had information regarding approximately 115,000 individuals and regarding their attitudes to immigration and their socio-demographic characteristics. We combined this data with historical data from the so-called Manifesto project from, uh, that runs from 1945 till 2008. We actually coded the by content analysis party manifestos since 1945 for each country and in, uh, that we observed. And uh, basically for each party that was at power for each given year, we uh, have established whether this party has been uh, a party that prevailed the, the value of equality or tradition. So for instance, typically so social democratic parties would be one, uh, would be parties putting forward more uh, equality values, whereas uh, for example, Christian Democrat parties would be parties that would be putting forward more traditional values. So uh, after that, we, uh, we, we decided to approach our problem with the so-called age period cohort model, uh, where uh, in this type of models, uh, individuals age is seen as an individual level characteristics. Uh, but on the other hand, individuals presence in a birth cohort or a specific time period uh, is perceived more as a group membership and therefore modeled as a contextual effect. So just to give you an example, so for instance, uh, the, of the age period cohort model. So if I uh, personally uh, feel tired because I'm getting old, this would be an age effect, an individual effect. Uh, but uh, uh, if the, the assessment would be that I'm actually feeling tired because life is so stressful nowadays in these years, this would be a period effect that all of us are experiencing because we are living exactly in this point of time. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if uh, uh, my generation, however you would like to to uh, see it uh, is uh, feeling tired in general, this would be a cohort effect. People born around the same time in the same place experiencing the same type of, um, of effects, uh, this would be a cohort effect. So in our particular case, because we also had uh, several countries, we actually modeled a so-called hierarchical age period cohort model. Uh, these models are specifically designed for repeated cross-sectional data and individuals are nested in both cohorts and periods. So uh, these models are called uh, cross-classified uh, with a cross-classified structure. And uh, these country periods, which is survey year and country cohorts are actually nested in country. So um, just to give you an example, so for instance, we have, uh, we have uh, me that I belong to a cohort. Uh, so the people born around the same time in the same place. Uh, I'm also surveyed in the year 2022. So this would be the, in, in the country I live in. So this would be the country period. 
And of course, uh, the fact that I belong to a cohort in a certain country and a uh, year in a certain country, uh, I also, uh, there is still a similarity bit, uh, for everyone living in this country compared to an, a completely different country. Um, so in our model, our dependent variable have been attitudes towards migration, which is an additive index ranging from zero to 30, uh, asking respondents to uh, answer the question whether immigrants coming to live here are good or bad for the country's culture, uh, whether they are good or bad for the country's economy, and whether they make the country a better or worse place to live. Our main explanatory variable where the, as I have already discussed, where the share of principles of equality tradition in party manifestos, uh, weighted by the votes party has received in election for each country year. Uh, so once again, what we meant by equality was a special protection for underprivileged social groups. Um, for example, the end of racial and gender discrimination, removal of class barriers. So it's not necessarily regarding immigration per se, but in general, a principle of equality of different groups of people. On the other hand, the principle of tradition was more about the maintenance and stability of the traditional family as a value, uh, support for the role of religious institutions in state and society, prohibition, censorship and suppression of immorality and unseemly behavior and so on and so forth. So here we can see in the countries under question that we studied uh, how the principles of equality and tradition in each country um, went from the year 1945 till 2015. As you see, uh, as parties uh, in power change, also the principles in each country change. And of course, in our model, we also controlled for other characteristics at the individual level for, of course, for age, but also for whether a respondent has a university degree, for the gender, urban residence, income difficulties, and whether the respondent is a minority member. At the country cohort level, we actually control for the percentage of university educated within each country cohort, the ethnic fractionalization, uh, for each country cohort when, when they were in their impressionable years, uh, the net migration when the cohort has been in, in their impressionable years, which was uh, actually marked between the age of 18 and 23, and the unemployment rate. And at the country period level, we actually controlled for the general political climate of equality of the, in the year of the survey, uh, and also the climate of tradition for, uh, we control for foreign stock, the net migration and unemployment. And uh, here you can see uh, the results. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see the cohort random effects. On the right-hand side, you see period random effects. What this shows in each country is that on the left, the cohort effects, um, you can see that uh, the, it's not a very linear relationship. What this means is that it is not necessarily true for each country that each single older cohort is more negative towards migration than a younger cohort. So what we see is that uh, this, uh, for instance, in Norway, the oldest cohort is indeed the most uh, negative towards immigration, but for instance, also the younger, the youngest cohort is quite negative towards immigration. Uh, in some countries, the trends are a little bit different, but the, the most important takeaway uh, from this is that the relationship between cohorts and anti-immigration attitudes is not necessarily linear. So we cannot expect each time that older cohorts will always be more uh, anti-immigration than younger cohorts. On the right-hand side, you see the so-called period random effects. And uh, what this means is for each country, how at the aggregate level, people in, in that country in that year of survey have been pro or anti-immigration. So, uh, Again, uh, you see that, uh, that it fluctuates. So it's not, uh, not, none of the countries follows a linear pattern where it would be becoming simply more negative or simply more positive towards 
immigration. And uh, here you actually see a result of uh, results of a hierarchical multilevel cross-classified model explaining cohort differences in attitudes to immigration across nine countries. Uh, so these are results for all the countries together uh, controlling for them. Uh, and what we see in, uh, in uh, model one is the results for the individual level characteristics. So we see that in, in general, indeed, uh, all the respondents are more anti-immigration when we look only at the effect of age. We see that uh, higher educated respondents are more pro-immigration. As, um, and how you can see this from the numbers is that uh, when, when you see a minus, that's a negative effect. And when you see a, a plus, that's a positive effect on attitudes to immigration. So more pro-immigration attitudes. Uh, however, the most interesting part for us is model two and model three. So in a, which are the country cohort levels, which were the, the variables we were interested in. And indeed we do see that uh, it, um, the effect of these variables is statistically significant. And uh, so cohorts growing up in a political climate of equality are significantly more likely to be pro-immigration than other cohorts and cohorts growing up in a political climate of tradition are significantly more likely to be more negative towards immigration. And uh, these results stand also when controlling for other possible confounding factors as we see in model four. So uh, to conclude, um, Differences in attitudes towards immigration between uh, the young and the old uh, are due to the uh, different generational socializations. Uh, differentiation in political be behavior does not require radical shocks in the form of landmark events or regime change, but the overall political climate matters too. Uh, values and norms in the political zeitgeist during formative years inform the opinions about immigration today. So uh, in, in, in this way, uh, we can a uh, little bit assess also what will happen in the future, because what is happening now will impact the generations that are coming of age at, uh, in this moment. So uh, the, the people that are now between 18 and 25 years old might um, form their attitudes, which will then prevail even many years later. So we can ask ourselves whether the future is actually tolerant or not. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>